Hello, I'm your host, Kyrie Douglas, and welcome to Catalyzing Computing, the official podcast of the Computing Community Consortium. The Computing Community Consortium, or CCC for short, is a programmatic committee of the Computing Research Association. The mission of the CCC is to catalyze the computing research community and enable the pursuit of innovative, high-impact research. In this episode of Catalyzing Computing, I sit down with Liz Bradley, the current vice chair of the CCC Council. Liz has been with the Department of Computer Science at the University of Colorado at Boulder since January of 1993. Her current research activities focus on nonlinear dynamics and chaos, as well as scientific computation and AI. In this episode, we discuss teaching computational thinking, participating in the Olympics, and using math and computing to analyze ice cores. Enjoy. Here with Vice Chair Liz Bradley, coming from Washington, D.C., following the fall council meeting. How are you doing today, Liz? Doing well, thank you. Um, so let's start with your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get involved with computer science? I was born in New York City to a father who was a mathematician and an athlete and a mother who was a social worker and a performing arts nut, and I inherited all four of those addictions. <laughs> um, my parents started a, uh, a small telecommunications test equipment company in our basement when I was about seven. And so I grew up soldering PC boards and, and op amps and resistors and things like that. Then I went to MIT, mostly out of kind of that seemed to be the right thing to do if you were interested in this stuff. And I majored in electrical engineering, largely because it was one of the harder majors on campus and I was feeling honorary. And then I got hired by the computer science department at the University of Colorado. So uh, I'm not actually trained in computer science, which has made it a little exciting to teach courses in computer science. So I guess what prompted the transition from electrical engineering to computer science, other than getting hired, I guess? Or was that the only... Well, I was actually in the far end of electrical engineering from computer science. I was an analog circuit designer, which is as far as you can get pretty much in double E from CS. Mm -hmm. But I was in an EECS department, and so all of us had to take, um, well, two computer science courses if you were a double E. Um, the transition was really mostly because of the job that I got. I got hired by a department that was a computer science department, although a very uh, interesting computer science department. My department at the time I was hired had a lot of people with PhDs in other fields, and actually not very many with PhDs in computer science. We're a very eclectic department, and we continue in that way even to this day. Interesting. Um, so I guess I want to ask you a question about your time at MIT. So I noticed on your website you mentioned that you no longer really consider yourself a, uh, I guess, graduate of, of MIT due to events surrounding Senior House. So yes. Can you explain what Senior House is and, and what happened with that? Sure. Um, senior House was the oldest dorm on campus, hence its name, the Senior House. And it was uh, a wonderful kind of haven for what I call the outliers among the outliers. MIT people are kind of weird anyway. And if you're an outlier in that community, then um, it can be hard to find a home in a traditional dormitory. So Senior House was leftover hippies, flower children, um, you know, kind of go out with whoever we want to. And increasingly over the years, the optics of that bothered the administration because they didn't like some of the, the imagery. They didn't like the long hair and the free love and what they perceived as a drug problem, which was actually not a drug problem. And so they came in and sanitized it. And soon after that, they came in and closed it. Um, and I felt that that was a travesty because MIT had always been a really good place that was very accepting of different kinds of people. And this cleanup situation just really bothered me, especially because they concocted evidence for this. They used a survey. Mm -hmm. So they used a private survey that they gave to the students um, about wellness and health. And they used that data to close the dorm. They also, again, concocted evidence about, or they, they claimed that there were, was a high suicide rate in the storm, and it was actually one of the lowest on campus. So they closed something that was a wonderful thing for a lot of people because of optics. Hmm. 
And what year was it that you were at MIT and when did they close it? I was there, I entered as a freshman in the fall of 78. I graduated with a doctorate in the summer of 1992. I was in senior house for the first five of those years and they closed it two or three years ago. Okay. So very recent. Yes, very recently. Um, does Boulder have a similar, any sort of similar institutions? Like what role do you think institutions like that play on college campuses and universities? I think they're very important because there's so much pressure to conform on college campuses. I don't know anything about the living groups at Colorado, at the University of Colorado, so I don't know how to answer that. So why did you decide to go into teaching in the first place as opposed to industry or or something else? It's actually a really good question because my parents really wanted me to take over their business when I graduated <laughs> from MIT, but I had done some TAing and I had, you know, TAed a course where I was actually responsible for the recitations. And so I was at the blackboard teaching and I saw light bulbs go off in people's head and I was hooked. So once you got to Colorado, did you experience any challenges as far as becoming a teacher? You said you had TA experience, but how difficult was that making that transition, especially in a CS department if that wasn't your yeah. specific training? Um, the first course that I taught, and I continue to teach it to this day, is a course on nonlinear dynamics or so-called chaos theory, which is my research field. And so there was no challenge with the material. However, there was a challenge with calibration. I remember I started with well, like 15 or 20 students, and I went into it hard. I went into it swinging, and I blew people away. And I looked up two weeks later, and I had three people left in the class, <laughs> and I recalibrated. So that was the challenge. Was And this happens to almost every assistant professor is they try to, to do too much and blow people away and that then people can't learn. By do too much, you mean like introduce too many complicated concepts or be too strict grading wise or? Good question. So for me, it was about uh, not so much the number of concepts, but the level of formality that I was using. I was being very theoretical. I was going theorem, proof, corollary. And that was not appropriate for my new audience. It would have been fine at MIT, but it was not appropriate to the audience that I had. Okay. And so I had to recalibrate. To answer your other question, I also had to teach, loved to teach, got to teach uh, courses in computer science that I had never taken. And so that was an interesting challenge. I had to learn the stuff first and then teach it. But I think that was a real advantage for the students because... It hadn't been 30 years since I learned it, and so I remembered quite vividly my path in learning it and what was hard and what was easy, and I think that made me a better teacher. I also was able to say, I don't know, and I had many opportunities to do that, and the students would learn that I would go look it up and explain it. So that's, I think, a, an advantage of someone who's not a computer scientist teaching a computer science course. So what kind of computer science courses did you start out teaching? I, I taught mostly numerical courses, so numerical mm. methods, things like how to solve a differential equation, how to fit a curve through a bunch of points, how to take a derivative numerically, things like that. I also taught the 300 and some person intro to computing for engineers course for a bunch of years. And that was an interesting challenge because um, when I inherited that course... I inherited it from um, people in another department who taught it more as tool use. Here is the keystroke sequence that you use to get Excel to do thus and such. Whereas in computer science, we want to teach computational thinking. And so I had to um, change the course a bit. And that involved some uh, politics and some diplomacy. <laughs> uh so related to this idea, I know like CS plus X is sort of a big kind of thing, especially in now like elementary schools, high schools. As you said, sort of the computational thinking is very important. So I know you don't teach on that level, but do you have any thoughts as far as how computational thinking can be better taught throughout the U.S.'s educational system or... Yeah, my, my partner actually does research in this area, so I hear about it at the dinner table. This is... Um, something that goes back many, many years. It has been called different things. 
It hasn't always been called data science or computational thinking, but it's been going on for 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. I think that a good path into this is via data and uh, how to think about analyzing data and how to think about what data, what content they have and what problems they might have. I'm using plural for data, which is a little bit weird, but I do that. And I think that's a good path into it because it motivates the kids. You're not going to, if you just tell them to write a program that does hello world, they're not going to be interested. But if you have, like, say you have data about social media use, then you can get a kid to write code that analyzes that social media use because it's motivating, because um, the results are interesting to them. And then you can suck them into statistics and all sorts of other good stuff. Now, personally, I'm more of a calculus person than a statistics person, but I don't think that has a good place, for example, in elementary school. <laughs> and yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I guess related to using using computation in different formats, I know you have some work on using computer science and math to model human motion, specifically dance. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain a little bit about those projects? I know there's something called Chaographer. Yep. Is that how you pronounce it? Sure. Um, so how does that work? Because I, I read it and I did not understand it. Okay. <laughs> so um, the notion of modeling motion means you're trying to come up with a description of it. And we're not actually quite doing that. What we were doing um, is doing a similar thing that a composer does when he or she is making a variation on a theme in music. Uh, they, the person takes the theme and changes it around a little bit. You can still recognize the theme, but it's a little different. That's a musical variation. What we wanted to do was use the mathematics of chaos to do that with, with motion. And this was inspired by someone who did this with uh, music. Her name is Diana Dabby. She's a professor at Olin, and she's wonderful. So she came up with the idea to use the mathematics of chaos to generate variations on musical sequences. And the way that works, you need to know a little bit about chaos. So chaos is a very sexy name for a very common kind of mathematical behavior that, um, kind of like a hurricane, has a pattern. You see this big swirling thing. But if you were a butterfly and you were in uh, one part of that hurricane and then you were the second butterfly and you were an inch away, you would probably get swept in very, very different directions by the hurricane. And yet the hurricane's structure is fixed. Another example we use in the field is you think about an eddy in a stream and the, the swirling patch of water is fixed. You look at it from above, it's got, it looks the same all the time. I mean, it's moving, but the structure of the vortices is the same. But again, if you drop two wood chips in that eddy at very close, very, you know, an angst from apart, both of them would travel through the same eddy. And if you had a stop action photograph, um, you could follow the, the path of the, each of those wood chips and it would trace out the full eddy, but in a completely different order. So what we did was we made a mathematical mapping that associated a dance piece with the path of a wood chip in an eddy. And then we dropped a wood chip in a different part of the eddy and it traced out a different path, but through the same eddy. And so the idea was that the, um, there's some structure there of the dance, and we forcibly mapped it to the structure of the eddy. And then we allowed um, basically a sample to kind of explore that eddy in a different way. And so that was Chaographer. Uh, it generated variations on dance pieces that were quite interesting. This is in the kind of early to mid-90s, mid-90s. And so one of my demonstration pieces is the Macarena. Mm -hmm. And the first time I played the chaotic Macarena at a conference, a uh, guy piped up from the audience and said, looks like Al Gore doing the Macarena. <laughs> so you could tell it was the Macarena, but something was different. And mm. that's what we were going after. So, because I, I watched some of the video clips of, of the chaographer on your website. So what would be the use case for such a system? Say like you want to build a virtual environment and have everyone dance in slightly different ways. Or uh, imagine if you are generating sequences um, for a flight simulator to throw at a pilot. Mm -hmm. You want those flight sequences to look consistent in some way, but you don't want them to be predictable. 
or let's say you're driving, designing a video game and you don't want the, the bad guy at level nine to always do the same five things, one after the other. But you don't want him to do something that's radically different. You want him to kind of stay in character, but not be predictable. Mm. So those are a couple of ways. Okay. So is this system being used in those kind of nope. mechanics? No. I went to see, I went to um, Boeing to propose this as a way to generate basically flight simulator sequences. And I was told that that was not possible because pilots in flight simulators insisted on being told in advance what they were going to be confronted with. And so this was a non-starter, which I found kind of terrifying. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I, this may have changed since, but this I found kind of terrifying. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty shocking. And then I went to video game designers and... Um, they said, they patted me on the head and said, that's nice. We've read your papers. We'll do it from here. Hmm. So I don't know if it's being used, actually. Okay. Interesting. Well, maybe someone will listen to this and we'll find out. Hopefully. So I guess related to that, you mentioned one of your parents did something in the arts as well. My mother was, uh, she just loved going to the ballet and going to modern dance and going to theater. Is that partially what inspired sort of the interest in this project besides the chaos? Yes. So when I saw Diana Dabby's work on music, and this was actually not my idea. This is an idea of a student of mine who's now on the faculty at the University of California at Santa Cruz, Josh Stewart. He came up after class when I played Diana's videotape. Well, at the time it was a cassette tape. Um, and he said, uh, I'm a ballroom dancer. Do you think we could do this for dance? And so I was like, that is really cool. So we did that. And then we actually... Um, and this may have been influenced more by my love of dance. I got together with a dancer and we made a performance piece that was a duet between a human dancer and a motion captured animated avatar who was doing variations on the same dance that my colleague had composed and projected on three huge screens behind him wow. while he danced and all done yeah. to, you know, you had to do this, the Bach Goldberg variations. Wow. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see. Bouncing off this, but you're also an Olympic athlete, right? You're on the rowing team. Yep. Not that this has anything to do with computer science, but can you talk <laughs> a little bit about that experience? Sure. I sometimes joke that the Olympics were my reason for taking a long time to get through my PhD. <laughs> um, you probably heard the uh, the dates. I was a freshman. I class. I was class of 1983 at MIT, and then I didn't get my PhD till nine years later. Uh, but that was because I was training pretty hard. And my advisor was really understanding about it, which was great, partially because there aren't a lot of MIT people who are in the Olympics. My teammates on the Olympic team who went to Harvard um, got a lot less slack from their institutions. <laughs> One of my teammates, JT, she had to miss the opening ceremonies, or sorry, she had to miss the closing ceremonies because Harvard wouldn't let her miss a class. Wow. So she had to leave, go home from Seoul to make it to back to her classes and miss the closing ceremony of the Olympics, which is the single part of the Olympics that is the most for the athletes. Because in the opening ceremony, you march in by, com by country. The closing ceremony, you all come in running in at once. Yeah. And it's just so cool. Do I show the closing ceremony on TV? They must. I don't know if I've they ever watched do, it. They do, but by then people are kind of in Olympic fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, the most one of the nice things for me was that the rowing is the first part of the Olympics. So the Olympics is 16 days. Uh, the rowing is done in the first week. So we just watched everything. And we had these credentials that would get us in, obviously, everywhere. So you'd meet somebody in the dining hall, and they were a field hockey player, and they'd invite you to their game, and you'd go ride on their bus. And I learned a lot about other people's sports, which was really cool. So you also have some projects using computer science to do earth and planetary science. I know there's one on... Um drilling Arctic ice. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk a little bit about those projects and the interesting results? Sure. So ice cores are um, basically fossilized water. Mm -hmm. And as you go deeper in the core, what you're looking at is snow that fell further and further back in time. So it is a time series record of samples of the Earth's atmosphere at a particular place. And the ones we work with are in Antarctica. That community, the ice core community, does amazing things. But 
they haven't used a whole lot of high-powered mathematics to date. Part of that is because the timelines for the core are a real challenge. An ice core doesn't come with a manual that says four inches down it's 10 years old and five inches down it's 20 years old. You have to figure that out from the data. And you can do that using layer counting, but only down to a certain point. Beyond that, you have to do all sorts of conniptions with looking at the waves and the data, and then you kind of use models. And so the timeline of the data is a problem. If you're interested in time series data, patterns with time, and the timeline isn't great, that's a major problem. So we used um, information theory on this. My, my love is nonlinear time series analysis, but this data is not good enough for that. So we used a more statistical technique called information theory, which takes back to Claude Shannon, um, and his huge revelation was that you can actually think about the information in a time series without actually knowing anything about what the symbols mean. It's just remarkable. So you can think about how information propagates forward in time through a, a, a sequence of data without knowing what anything means. Now, we actually do know what it means, but um, the cool thing is, so the technique we use figures out across the core how much knowing something about one chunk of the core tells you about the data a little bit later in the core. And that has connections to predictability. And so what we found was that during the glacial periods, this measure of predictability is actually a fair bit higher. So perhaps the climate is more predictable in the glacial periods and less predictable in the Holocene. We're not sure of that, but when are each of those periods? Oh, the last glacial minimum was started. Well, so the Holocene, um, started about eight, nine, eight, 9,000 years ago. And then there was a bunch of years of transition. And then the start of the glacial period was, and they, they measure time series backwards. It always messes me up. So they measure in years before present. So the timeline goes backwards. So the glacial is starting at 17, 18,000 years ago and going back, gosh, I don't know, 60, 70 at least. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So this too is, it's not modeling the climate. Mm. It is looking at samples of evidence that the climate leaves behind and trying to see whether there are differences between the patterns in those data during the different cold and hot regimes. So I know when I was reading into this, one of the challenges is that things don't evenly layer themselves, Yep. right? So how do you handle those obstacles? Yes, that's that's the big one. So because an ice core gets denser, the further down you go, basically just because of the pressure of the overburden of ice, stuff on top of you makes you, squashes you and makes you denser. Um, that means that the same centimeter of ice represents a lot more years if it's from down deep in the core than up high in the core. And that's a problem mainly because the laboratory technology samples the ice evenly in space. So it samples every half centimeter. And at the top of the core, that's 1 40th of a year. At the bottom of our core, it's 1.4 years. And so again, that's the deformation of the time axis. And so you need to basically evenize that time axis, which means throwing out data at the top and making it up at the bottom. And making up data is always a bad idea. <laughs> and in this case, what they do is what's called linear interpolation, which is you have, you have two dots two values of your of your data and they're spaced 1.4 years apart and you really want to know what what the data was every 120th of a year so you draw a line between them mm -hmm. and you take points along that line 120th of a year apart it's called linear interpolation it's something i taught in numerical computing and it has dire effects on things like predictability because if you're if you're moving up in a line you're very predictable so it trashes the information content of the data mm -hmm. And so we have been trying to figure out how much that's impacting us for a couple of years now. Okay. So are there any specific objectives of these like uh, ice core studies beyond just trying to learn more about the Earth? Well, this being science, uh, there were some objectives originally, and they, w they went out the window pretty quickly, and we started other objectives. The first experience we had was very interesting. I went to my colleague, Jim White, who's um, one of the authors of the IPCC climate change. I mean, he's a very, very good ice core scientist. And I said, hey, we have this idea for this information theory junk. Can you give me some data? He gave me some data and we, we analyzed it. We came back and we said, well, 
This is really interesting. What happened to your data between 5.7 and 8,000 years ago? And he turned white. <laughs> because that was a chunk of the core that they had analyzed with an old instrument. What we had showed was basically that there was noise in that data. Mm. Because it looked unpredictable. Basically just looks at... If you, have a little, if you have a little chunk of the core and then you have another little chunk of the core further down and you know something about this, what does it tell you about that? Mm. And if the, if the answer is nothing, then there's no predictability. If the answer is something, then there is some predictability. And that measure all of a sudden jumped for this segment of the ice. And so that had not been visible in the raw data. So they did not know that there was noise in their data. So... That actually caused us to write a grant to resample that chunk of ice. And so it's anomaly detection. It's a way to do anomaly detection that is useful and that is now part of the analysis pipeline in the lab. So that was an unforeseen result. But it got their attention because I was able to say, what's going on here? And it was something that they didn't know was happening and that I showed them. And what happened was that's a very interesting time period for them because that's the, the first part of the Holocene. And so when they got the core back from Antarctica, they immediately analyzed that piece. And then somewhat later, they got a new instrument and used that for the rest of the core. And that new instrument worked better? Yes, it did. And we used it. I didn't. Um, our students did. Um, my postdoc, Josh Garland at the time, who's now at um, Santa Fe Institute, is an, a mid-year fellow. Uh, he and Jim's postdoc wrote a grant, an eager, an NSF eager, and they reanalyzed. They went back to the the ice core lab, the nickel, the National Ice Core Lab, or it's something else now in Golden. So this actually, this core is 25 miles south of me. All 3.3 kilometers of this core are in an ice library in Golden, Colorado. Wait, how big is it? 3.3 kilometers long. Wow. So that's a lot of half centimeter chunks to melt and put in the spectrograph. <laughs> so that's a, it's a real pain. So we went back, they went back down to the lab and pulled that chunk of ice back off the shelf. It was, I think it was about 100 meters, I can't remember, and put that into the new machine. Okay. So I have two follow-up questions. Have you been to Antarctica? I have not. I wish. <laughs> and I know you're not an ice core scientist, so this might be outside of your scope, but how do they transfer this ice? And once they get it there, you said they melt it? What happens after they melt it? Is it right. no longer usable? Or do they remelt it in some way to preserve the data? No, these are these are good questions. So the ice itself comes back in two meter chunks. There are cylinders about four inches across and six some feet long, and each of them is in. Um, actually, I don't know how they're brought back, but I know how they're stored. They're in these kind of. They look like the tubes that you take a poster to a conference in, except they're metal, and there's there's just like it's a library. They're just all these things. The way they analyze them is they take one of these out and they take a bandsaw and they take a little sliver off the side of it. And then they cut that into half centimeter chunks and they put each one, this is not quite right, but it's close enough. They put each one individually into a, a melter mm -hmm. and they put it into a spectrograph. After that, they throw it out Okay. because, you know, you've messed with it. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So some of these older cores that have been reanalyzed a bunch of times there's not much ice left. <laughs> They've been kind of sliced sliced and diced. Yeah. So I guess as far as reproducibility, it seems like there's a big issue, right? If you're, yes. your core is limited and could potentially melt. Yes. And it's a big issue because a single core um, produces, oh, the, the lab that I work with is the water isotopes, the ratios of the heavy to light isotopes of oxygen and, and hydrogen. There are a zillion other things that ice core labs measure, and each of these cores comes back and gets measured by 10 different labs. So there's 10 people in there with bandsaws wanting pieces of it. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty dire. Wow. Um, but reproducibility is something else we're thinking about. And so, so, so there's been very little work where they've, they've redone the same measurement on different parts of the core. I was talking to Jim about that not long ago, and he was slightly unhappy about the lack of correlation between two different slivers of the same core, but I don't know if that's if that's been borne out. And it's very, very rare that you have two cores from near each other because these things are so expensive and so hard to gather. You go and you get one and you're happy. Mm. There is one place in the world where there are two cores next to each other, and that's at Northgrip in North Greenland Ice Core Project. 
where the drill got stuck. And they had to snap the cable, pull it out, get another drill, and drill one nearby. So there's, there is a partial duplicate from not too far away of one ice core. Wow. So you can't do statistics on this stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. That's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Tune in for part two of my interview with Liz, where we discuss nonlinear dynamics, chaos theory in pop culture, and the future of artificial intelligence. Remember to like, subscribe, and rate us five stars on iTunes. One editor's note, since recording this podcast, Liz Bradley has found out that there are some other replicant ice cores in existence. Until next time, peace. Peace.